the institute where I conduct most of my research was founded by the Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was an MIT-trained engineer and a Navy pilot and the sixth man to walk on the moon. He's also one of six surviving individuals who have been further from our planet than any other human being has in the history of humanity. And so his trip to the moon, of course, was an awesome journey, but it was the trip home that really changed the rest of his life. And as Edgar puts it, he is in the space capsule and he's lucky enough to have the window seat. And the capsule is rotating every two minutes, a full rotation, and he's viewing the Earth, the Sun, the Moon, and the stars. The Earth, the Sun, the Moon, and the stars. And you have to imagine, from space, the stars look like they're twice as numerous and twice as bright. And as he puts it, he was overcome all at once with this curious sensation of being interconnected with everything he saw. He felt himself as one with the Earth, with the Moon, with the stars. He recognized at a very deep level that the same molecules that made up the heavens and even the space capsule were the molecules that made up his own body. And so this sense of interconnectedness flooded through his system and it was a direct download, he felt like, from the universe, a subjective form of knowing, but an absolutely authoritative knowledge all the same. Not only did he feel this sense of interconnectedness, he also saw that there was an intelligence behind everything. There was almost a sacredness or divinity infusing every single thing he saw, a luminosity. And so when Edgar got back to Earth, he spent the rest of his life and is spending the rest of his life trying to make sense of what happened to him. And part of the way he's doing that is by founding the Institute of Noetic Sciences in 1973, where I'm now the director of research. So Edgar's not the first person on the planet to have had this experience, of course. There have been people throughout millennia who have recorded experiences like this, repeated experiences, actually thousands and thousands of people, and they have given birth to some of the world's greatest religions. So for example, Buddhism, this is uh, Nagarjuna, who was one of the Buddhist philosophers in the 15th century, Buddhism has a concept called the concept of dependent origination, which is where there are no materials, there is no thing that exists independently from other things. Everything is a nested set of relationships. There may be sort of provisional boundaries between you and I, between things, but they're not solid, they're temporary, they're, it, they're effervescent, whereas this interconnectedness is what stays. In one of the Buddhist Dharma Sutras, there is a beautiful metaphor called Indra's web or Indra's net. And it's kind of like a spider web, except that it goes off in three dimensions infinitely through the universe. These golden or silver threads that interconnect every single being and every single event that's ever happened. And if you look more closely at Indra's net, what you see are these little luminescent jewels at each junction, and each one of those can represent a person or an individual consciousness or even a cell or an atom. And when you see the image or the light that shines in one, whenever it changes, it's echoed throughout the rest of the web and every other individual consciousness. In Hindu tradition, there's a beautiful doctrine called the honey doctrine, which says that the earth, the being of the earth is like honey, and all of our beings are like honey, and the being of the earth absorbs us into itself, and we absorb the being of the earth and the universe into us. It's the essence, the milk of existence. And because of this sort of sticky interconnection, when I know one thing, I know everything. When I speak to one person, I speak to everyone. When I touch this table, I'm also touching the sun. And it's not only that there's an interconnection, it's also that there's a luminosity that animates every single one of us, all beings on the planet, just like sunshine shining through honey. This is called Purusha in this tradition, the animating life force that connects us all. So between 
this sticky substance that keeps us all together and the luminosity that connects the individual to the cosmic, there is a way that one cannot be without the other, and when one thing happens to one aspect of the system, it also happens to the other. It's a very sweet metaphor. <laughs> so this isn't only in Eastern traditions that we find this. It's also in Christianity. Christ in the Bible says, my father is in me and I am in him and I am in you and you are in me and salvation has to do with understanding that God's kingdom is in all of us and that Christ's body we are each a part of. It appears in Judaism, in Islam, and in the world's indigenous traditions, which actually don't make a very big deal out of it because they believe it's absolutely common sense that we're all interconnected. So not only have these kinds of subjective experiences of oneness and interconnection, this realization about the nature of reality being completely interconnected started religions, they've also underlied entire movements uh, Martin Luther King says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We're tied into a network of mutuality, a single garment of destiny. And so that when injustice is done to one, it's done to everyone. This kind of realization has also been something that underlied civil rights movements, but also human rights movements. And so this is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Albert Schweitzer, who was one of the first anti-war, anti-nuclear activists and was a, someone who built hospitals and worked in Africa and made his life about altruism. And his work came out of this idea that we are united with all of life and that we cannot any longer live for ourselves alone. John Muir, so this is another way that these experiences of interconnectedness have impacted our society is by pushing people toward conservation movements because when we find that we are interconnected with this whole system of being and stand in awe and wonder of that realization, we can't do anything else but begin to conserve that precious blue jewel that Edgar Mitchell and other astronauts saw from space. And John Muir puts it in a very pithy way. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And so also science. This realization has inspired scientists to look further, to look deeper into the nature of reality. And Albert Einstein went all the way as to say that our sense of ourselves as individuals who are separated from the rest is an optical delusion of our consciousness and that our work in this lifetime is to break free from that prison, that delusion. Another wonderful philosopher, Alan Watts, said not only is it a delusion, it's a dangerous delusion because when I feel like I'm separate from you, when I can keep myself separate from it, from the planet, from things that I think are other, I can engage in actions that benefit me but harm others. When I break free of that delusion, I can no longer do that. And so science now is a way that we are increasingly relying on more and more instead of religion or in addition to religion to understanding the nature of reality and what things are really like and what our potential is. And so I'm engaged in a scientific effort to look into this phenomenon of interconnectedness. Is it true that we are, in fact, interconnected, not only at a subjective level, but maybe at an objective or a physical level? Are we more I or are we more we? Or are we both? Is there any way to investigate this paradox that makes sense in the natural world? And so first I'll start with telling you a little bit about what science is telling us about just the interconnection in our own bodies. For a long time there was an emphasis on little individual parts of our body that were responsible for certain things. So if I was thirsty, it was a small part of my brain that was thirsty. Or if I see a snake in my pathway, it's in the snake section of my brain. It turns out that our brains and our bodies are these distributed networks of holistic responses to the world around us, and no one part functions much without the other part. There's a diversity in our cells, for example, skin cells, gut cells, lung cells, brain cells, 
that can't really work without one another. It's like a symphony of life. And this is how we are now starting to look at the body and the brain as a whole system that must be addressed together. Now, another interesting thing is we're realizing now that we have thousands of other creatures that actually live in and on us. Microbes, fungi, all these little guys. So when we say we are a we, it's not just the royal we anymore. It's quite literal, the microbial we, you might say. <laughs> also, our DNA, we're finding now, doesn't actually, it's, it's not a blueprint for who we become. It's not a destiny or a determined way that will emerge. What we're finding now is that for the most part, genes are expressed in an experience-dependent fashion. They are expressed in response to how we interact with the world around us, and in particular, many of our psychological traits and our personality traits are developed as an interaction between our genes and thousands of micro interactions we have with our caregivers as we're growing from being infants to children, but also in our adult lives. So who we are is absolutely determined by not just our genetic code, but every single person and situation that we interact with throughout our lives, particularly when those are repeated. Social psychology is finding that we are more socially mediated than we ever knew we were. There's contagious, uh, contagiousness of happiness. There's contagion of obesity. As Malcolm Gladwell said, there are contagions of ideas, epidemics of ideas. And the new social science is starting to show us that when we're in a room with other people, so much of what's happening in our bodies, in our brains, in our thoughts, in our beliefs, and what we have perceived to be our free will is actually this complex mediational process that we're in with other people in the room. There's also some very interesting research happening now in social media where you can actually track the way that ideas make their way out into uh, the world, kind of like watching migrational patterns. And so all of that is maybe what you could call traditional science. It's it's looking into more and more the ways that we are socially interconnected. What we're engaged in at the Institute of Noetic Sciences takes it one step further, where we're not only looking at how people are connected through traditional ways of knowing through the five senses, but also beyond that. Is there a way that we're interconnected that isn't through traditional connection? And so what we do in one set of experiments, for example, is we get a pair of people and we separate them. We take one person to a sender's chamber where they sit in front of a closed circuit television or now an internet live stream. And they're shown their partner on the screen off and on. Now the sender might be hooked up to autonomic measures or brainwave measures as well. But then we escort the receiver to a 2,000 pound electromagnetically shielded steel box. So they are sitting there protected from any influence, including that that any, their partner might send on a traditional level. And so here we are having the sender shown the image of the person. And when they're shown the image of the person who's the receiver, they're asked to direct all their attention and intention toward that person. When the person goes off the screen, they're asked to remove their intention and attention from that person. And what's fascinating is that what we're finding is when the sender sh sends that attention, intention, thought toward the person in the receiving chamber, the physiology of the person in the receiving chamber actually changes. And so we don't really have an explanation for this yet, but we do have now dozens of studies showing evidence for this connection. This is a slide from a different laboratory looking at how the brain reacts to a light flash. And what you see across the top is right in the middle, the sender has a light flash and their brain has a major reaction to that light flash. But you'll also see that their partner below has a little echo of that light flash. And so we haven't explained this yet but it is very enticing information about how we might be interconnected. These experiments were pioneered by Marilyn Schlitz and others at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We did an experiment where we brought in 
cancer patients and their partners and asked their partners to learn a compassionate intention intervention that was based on Tibetan practices. And after the training, what we found is that their connection at a distance again was increased. And so another way we're looking at interconnection is not just between people, it's between people's minds and the physical world. So this is an ingenious experiment that was developed by my colleague Dean Radin. And so what we know in quantum physics is that when we have a stream of light, a stream of photons that's being shot down a tunnel through two little slits, this is called the double slit experiment, um, when someone knows which slit the photons go through, when someone observes it or a machine observe it, observes it, the photons act like particles. When nothing is observing it, they act like waves. And you know that because you can see the pattern on the back wall. There's either two slits or there's a wave refraction pattern. So this is called the quantum measurement problem. We don't know why measurement or observation changes this. What we do in our laboratory is we have people look at the system only using their minds. So they're not using their eyes, they're not using a camera, they're not using any kind of the traditional measurement equipment. They're just observing the system, you could say psychically or clairvoyantly, they're projecting their minds into the system. And what we find is that when they're doing that, it collapses the wave function. In other words, the particles, the, the, the light stream, the photons, act more like particles than they do like waves, as though they were being observed in person. So again, both of these experiments, we don't know exactly what to make of the results, but we do know that, number one, the, the effect seems to be instantaneous. It happens at exactly the same time, so it doesn't seem to be sort of like sending an email or sending a letter. We also know that it appears to be non-local, so it doesn't matter that much if the person is 40 feet away or 400 or 4,000 or 400 miles away from either the receiver who's a human or from the double slit experiment. The final way I'll share with you, and there are other ways that we are looking at this phenomenon, is a set of colleagues and us are looking at whether collective upheavals in consciousness affect systems that are physical. And we use a random number generator, which is a little machine that spits out a series of zeros and ones at the rate of about 800 bits per second. And the idea is that if there is greater coherence in a collective group of people, you could say like a baseball game, um, we looked at things like 9-11, we've looked at the opening ceremonies, the, the Olympics, when lots and lots and lots of people's attention are focused on one thing, is there a little departure from randomness in this stream of random numbers? And what we find is that, in fact, there is a tiny departure from randomness that seems to correlate with exactly the same time that there are these huge upheavals in consciousness. So while tiny, the change is highly statistically improbable. So this is the kind of thing we're investigating using the tools of science to look into connection and interconnection both in person with each other and from a distance. And you might ask yourself, well, this is all fascinating, but why? What, why does this matter? I mean, other than the fact that maybe it's, you know, questioning the very fundamental basis of the nature of reality, why do we care? <laughs> well, <laughs> What brings me to do this work is that when we look at this interconnection, when we study the interconnection among people, if it is in fact the case that our minds influence our bodies, which we now know to be true, if it's the case that we influence each other much more than we ever thought was possible when we're in rooms with each other, when we watch each other on the TV, if it's even possible that we're connected at a distance, or maybe that we collectively are somehow connected to the way the physical world functions, then one of the things we can do is shift the way we are thinking. We can use our consciousness in ways that are constructive, innovative, reverent. We can bring positive influence into our world and it's not enough to just think positively, but I do believe that that kind of using our consciousness, recognizing that our consciousness matters, 
uh, is a precursor to the kind of action we all need to take to help our world thrive, to help humanity reach its full potential. And this is a quote from the Institute of Noetic Sciences first president, because of the interconnectedness of all minds, affirming a positive vision might be the most sophisticated vision that any one of us can take. Thank you. <laughs>